today, uh, the first day of this Rohatsu session, I want to review some of the uh, session precautions. Just to uh, go back to the basics. So, traditionally, uh, the three session precautions are no unnecessary talking, no looking around, and no social greetings. And uh, there's an obvious way that these precautions support our practice, but let's look at that and dig a little deeper into the precautions. So if you don't follow one of the precautions, it not only disturbs your mind, but also the mind of others. If you're putting efforts, your efforts into session, and then you talk unnecessarily with someone, it rattles your brain for a while afterwards, like the ringing of the bell that continues to vibrate for many minutes. But depending how emotionally or intellectually attached you are to the conversation, it could echo for more than a day in your mind. <laughs> Several days. The same is true with what we see. Often we look around to see how others are doing. <laughs> If we concentrate on our own practice, there's no room for looking around. When we look around, we start comparing, judging, and picking and choosing. And social greetings include saying good morning or making eye contact or patting someone as they pass by us. It's almost as if we don't want the other person to forget us, <laughs> as if they would <laughs> during the duration of a session. But by not following these precautions, we're avoiding digging into ourselves, we're holding back. So what will it take for you to commit completely? for you to go all in. So there are obvious ways that these precautions support session. By behaving in a certain way, our internal state is affected. Inside is reinforced by outside and outside is a manifestation of what's going on inside. And by following these precautions, inside and outside become a unified whole, which is everything as it is. So there's many ways to appreciate the three precautions. Um, I recently talked about them during our Saturday practice. There's a teaching of Dogen's called the Eight Awarenesses of the Enlightened Person. And these teachings are the last teachings of Dogen before his death. And they were also the last teachings of the Buddha before his death. And the very last of the Eight Awarenesses is avoid idle talk, which is almost identical with the first session precaution. Dogen wrote, Having realization and being free from discrimination <clears throat> is what is called <clears throat> avoiding idle, idle talk. <clears throat> so having realization and being free from discrimination is what's called avoiding idle talk. To totally know the true form of all things is the same as being without idle talk. So I might add that most idle talk is ego-centered. 
puffing us up or putting us down. Thus avoiding idle talk is the fruit of our practice and is identical with our wisdom. Only after overco overcoming the gap with others can we really avoid idle talk. <clears throat> so how can we accomplish overcoming the gaps in our life? So it's just attention. Attention to how we use our energy, to how we focus our energy. Attention to our zazen and attention to no unnecessary talking. And not only during session. So even thinking can be idle talk especially during session. So to clarify who we are, we cannot do it through discursive thinking. We must do it with actual practice with the whole body. In the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha tells the story of a man shot with a poison arrow and he starts to analyze the situation, wondering who shot the arrow and why, and from what tree the arrow, the wood of the arrow was made. He would die before he finds a fraction of the answers. So the Buddha says, immediately pull it out. So immediately, don't attach to your thoughts in your speech. Put yourself into your zazen and avoid idle talk. So much of our time is spent judging and evaluating and being anxious about the outcome. So in a way it's being anxious about being anxious. <laughs> like putting a head on top of your head what do you need another head for? You have a beautiful head right now. The first of uh, the eight awarenesses is having few desires. And the Buddha says, those who have many desires search for fame and profit, and there's much suffering. And those who have few desires look around less and desire little. So no looking around can mean having few desires. If we're satisfied, then we have few desires. If we examine ourselves closely, we see all kinds of desires, and yet ultimately there's nothing to gain. At the same time, there's nothing to lose either. So all things are the undisguised manifestation of the truth. So if we live in the present moment, there's no room for worry, upset, and aggravation. Unfortunately, our minds are always dwelling in the past or fantasizing about the future. By being attentive, we can stay grounded in the present. And the mind will settle into a state of rest where it's in balance and does not grasp after what we perceive to be pleasant and push away what we perceive to be unpleasant. As the mind settles down, we can experience our life, the situation and the people in it, 
without the tension of attachment or aversion. So in order for the mind to settle down, avoid looking around. So although we emphasize it in Sashin and Zazen, awareness and attentiveness are not limited to Zazen. We should extend our Zazen mind into all of our activities, especially Samu practice. Zazen mind is appropriate in every moment, whether we're sitting, standing, lying down, eating, or working. Every moment, we ought to live completely and wholeheartedly. But unfortunately, we're always looking outside ourselves for contentment and happiness. So those who do not see the way do not see it, even as they're walking on it. But it's always present. It's not hidden or obfuscated. We just need to keep bringing our attention back to the moment and notice without judging. That's our mantra, non-judgmental awareness. Another way to say it is unconditional presence. When we're unconditionally present, we do not judge. And we're aware of what is going on around us. So. In order to develop non-judgmental awareness, we need to be bigger than our problems, our worries, and our anxieties. Meditation makes us more spacious. We can hold more in the basket of our life. So whatever arises in your meditation or your life, it's just as it is. And if you can accept that, then there's no judgment. But still, we need to continue practicing because whatever we realize we easily forget or we can make it into something fixed and then we're stuck there so we practice in order to keep reminding ourselves of being aware without judgment throughout the day and night There are two stories from uh, Dogen's Tenzo Kyokun, uh, which is his instructions to the chief cook that I'd like to share that illustrate this point. Dogen said, during my stay at the Tian Tung Monastery, a priest, Lu, was in the office of the Tenzo. One day I found him earnestly drying up some mushrooms in front of the Buddha Hall with a bamboo stick in his hand and without a sledge hat on his head. The sun was shining down upon his head and the paving tiles were parched in the sun. In profuse perspiration he was strenuously drying mushrooms. Here and there, he seemed to me rather painful. His spine was bent with age like a bow, and his long eyebrows were white like the feathers of a crane. I went up to him and said, what is your Buddhist age? 68 was his answer. Why don't you make the serving monks or the underworkers do this work? And he replied, they are not me. 
And I said, if you're really one with Buddhism, I wonder why you work so hard in such a scorching sun. And he said, when else can I do it except now? When people ask me how they can experience the oneness and the interconnectedness of life, I think of this Tenzo said, when else can I do it except now? And of course, you all know my secret is Zazen practice is to just keep going. Even when you don't feel like it, just keep going. Even in the hot sun, when else can you do it? Continuous practice means just keep going. We can always find excuses to not practice Zazen, and I'm sure some of them are really brilliant. It reminds me of the quote sometimes attributed to the great violinist Yasha Heifetz. He said, if I don't practice one day, I know it. I don't practice two days, my critics know it. And if I don't practice three days, then everyone knows it. When you don't practice for three days, everyone knows it. Not, not only do you suffer, but so do all those around you. So what will it take for you to go fully in? I mean, right now. So Dogen related another story. He says, another time a 60 year old priest came aboard our ship and asked the Japanese passengers if they had any Cortinellus mushrooms. I served him some tea and asked him where he lived, and he was the Tenzo priest at a large monastery, and he said to me, tomorrow is Bodhidharma's Memorial Day. I have no such foodstuffs so that the monks there can enjoy that day. I thought of cooking vermicelli soup, but I found that there were no Cortinellus mushrooms to go with it. I came all the way expecting to get some mushrooms from the monks from all parts of our country. So I asked him, when did you leave the monastery? And he said, after lunch. And I said, how far is it from here? He said, about 14 miles. And I said, when do you go back? He says, I'm going back as soon as I can get some mushrooms. And I said, how glad I am to see you unexpectedly. And let's have a long chat about Buddhism. I'll serve you, Zen Master Tenzo. And he said, that's too bad. Without my direction, tomorrow's meals will not go well. And Dogen said, in such a great place as your monastery, there will be some other cooking monks enough to prepare the meal. I believe they can make meals without a single Tenzo priest. And he replied, old as I am, I hold the office of Tenzo. This is the training of my old age. How can I leave this duty to others? Moreover, I didn't get leave for a night's lodging, for a night's lodging out when I left there. Reverend Sir, Dogen said, why don't you do Zazen or read the koan of ancient persons? What's the use of working so hard as a Tenzo priest? On hearing my remarks, he broke into laughter and said, good foreigner, you seem to be ignorant of the true training and characters of Buddhism.
Of course, as you know, Dogen spent several years in China and, and found his true teacher and eventually returned to Japan. And he said, all things are the undisguised manifestation of truth. Everything, without exception, is the undisguised manifestation of truth. So my advice still is, you know, just keep going. Just keep going with your practice under all conditions. Because everything is the undisguised manifestation of truth if we see it clearly. 90% of transformation and growth in your practice is just showing up. And the other 90% is continuous practice <clears throat> that is a seed of all the Buddhas. <clears throat> <clears throat> During session, our responsibility <clears throat> is to follow the precautions and to not look around. <clears throat> Having few desires, we can really be who we are. <clears throat> Being so, we practice continuously and accomplish continuously. I vow... <clears throat> Excuse me. I vow continuous practice is commitment. And part of that commitment is choosing to work with those obstacles that interfere with the free flow of love and energy in ourselves and with others. Of course, the last precaution is no social greetings. Of all the eight awarenesses, we could talk about almost any one of them in this connection. As we could relate all of the eight awarenesses to any of the session precautions. So the fifth awareness is very important. It's not forgetting right thought. When the Buddha taught the eight awarenesses just prior to his death. He talked about right thought, but also after his enlightenment, the Buddha's his first teachings are the Eightfold Path, and the sixth is right thought, or maintaining right thought, which is the same as not forgetting right thought. So, in a way, this teaching of right thought is both the first word and the last word of the Buddha. So, what is meant by right thought? It could mean the mind of this very moment. So when we say no social greetings, we mean maintain the mind of this very moment. Of course we could greet mindfully, <laughs> but then what effect does it have on you and the other person? I always found it interesting that we can sit together for a week without talking, without looking at each other. And still, you get a sense of the other person, the energy they bring into the Zendo, and how they support your practice. You know? Then after session's over, there'll be plenty of time to greet each other. The Buddha said, 
For those who do not forget right thought, the robber-like multitude of, delu of deluding passions cannot break in. For those who do not forget right thought, the robber-like multitude of deluding passions cannot break in. So when we engage in social greetings during session, we're robbing ourselves. Our concentration is diluted. Our samadhi dribbles away. The same is true of looking around and talking unnecessarily. We steal from ourselves. So during session, by ignoring these precautions, we're stealing from others as well. And by following the precautions, the reverse is true. So we are our own best protection from the robber-like multitude of deluding passions. So each precaution is contained in the other precautions, seeing clearly and practicing them carefully. We cannot help but maintain all of them. The third awareness is enjoying serenity and tranquility. And Dogen says, being apart from all disturbances and dwelling alone in a quiet place is called enjoying serenity and tranquility. So in the midst of this session, together with everyone, let us dwell alone in a quiet place. Of course, alone means all one, all together. Let's dwell in a quiet place. As many of you know, the word session means to unify the mind so that many minds become one mind. And that's what session is. You know, we function as one mind, one body. See, not only following the precautions, but the protocols. We move sm uh, very smoothly, going in and out of the zendo, moving around in the dining area without bumping into each other. And then we can be apart from all disturbances. So the road to the true self is not for the weak of heart and the casual meditator. Those who are just curious will be quickly disappointed. There has to be a deep longing in your heart and a fire burning in your gut. You must be willing to plunge into the abyss of the unknown. And you must willing to surrender control to something larger than your fragmented ego. In fact, it's a state where you have absolutely no control. <laughs> Just letting go. So this session is set up to totally support your practice. You don't have to think about what to do next. There's a schedule. And then there's people who assume responsibility to make sure the meals are served and the dishes are cleaned, that the zendo is clean, that the atmosphere is bright and fresh for you to practice. And we maintain the buildings and the grounds. And it's all to support your practice, to give you the opportunity to penetrate deeper, penetrate deeper into those questions of who am I and what are the great matter of life and death.
or just to lessen your confusion and your anxiety and your nervousness. There's all kinds of benefits from this practice. So. And whatever reason you're here to practice uh, is honored and supported. But just be mindful of the precautions and the protocols. So no unnecessary talking, no looking around and no social greetings. Please maintain them well and maintain your Sazen practice well too. I think it was the sixth patriarch who said that Za means to sit immovable, to realize your true self. And Zen means not to be buffeted about by external events, external stimuli. So internally and externally, you know, unify your practice. But literally, za means sitting and zen means meditation. So, but it can be standing, lying down, walking, <clears throat> seated, doesn't matter. What's important is your intention and what kind of energy and effort you put into your practice. So. I remember years ago I met uh, So in Nakagawa Roshi. Some of you might know who he is. He's, he's one of the seminal Japanese Zen masters who had an impact on this country. And I said to them, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really trying hard in my practice. And he looked at me quizzically and he said, try, try. And I thought, well, of course, if I don't try, was it, what do I do, not try? <laughs> and I puzzled over that for quite a while till I read something of uh, Shunryo Suzuki Roshi who said, the best effort that we can make in our practice is to let go of whatever is extra, whatever we don't need. So look carefully and see what is it you need? What are you holding on to? And is it really important to hold on to it? As you know, Master Dogen, his enlightenment experience was when his teacher, Tendo Nyojo, shouted at the monks in the Zendo to drop off body and mind. <laughs> Mazumi Roshi used to say that so often, but he said it in Japanese. I've even memorized the Japanese. And he would go, Jin Shin Datsuraku. <laughs> drop off body and mind. And Dogen dropped off body and mind. And then, as you know, he went to Tendo Nyojo and he prostrated. And Tendo Nyojo said, why are you prostrating? He said, I've dropped off body and mind. He said, if you dropped off body and mind, who is this prostrating in front of me? And some of you know what Dogen said. The dropped off body and mind. So, if you let go of whatever you're holding on to, you can still function very nicely. So, drop off body and mind. Jin Shin Datsuraku. So, this is just the first day of Sashin. So, please continue your sincere practice. And I know some of you have 
obligations to work and you can only be here part time, but do your best during the day and maintain your practice well. <laughs>